Hi, I'm John. I'm one of the pastors here at the Tabernacle, and we're so glad that you're joining us today. If you'd like to, we have three different campuses, one in Buckley, Manistee, and Cadillac. We understand that there are times where you can't get out, and we appreciate you coming and joining us today. Hopefully this is a blessing to you. Enjoy. Have a great day. Good morning, Tabernacle. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. It's going to be a gorgeous day here in northern Michigan. Uh, as we say every week, or we try to uh, especially want to say good morning to those in our church family in Manistee and also in Cadillac. And just, uh, just by way of uh, being a family here, uh, uh, those of you in Manistee and the rest of our church, let's continue to be in prayer for our Manistee campus pastor, Pastor Seth, who's on a medical, uh, kind of a little bit of a sabbatical here. Uh, we're praying for healing for him. And then also for those of you in Cadillac, it doesn't have to be Easter to continue to invite people to your church. So uh, we encourage you and those in Buckley and in Manistee for that matter uh, to continue to talk to friends and neighbors who don't have a church home. Maybe you're seeking God. I know if you're sitting here in Buckley, you're wondering, well, where will we sit them? I, I just want to remind you, that's the board's problem, not mine. <laughs> Okay, so we do our part, we create headaches for them, praise God, let's go. Um, I want to start by saying one of the greatest joys in being a pastor can also be one of the greatest frustrations. Uh, most of you, you've heard my story, and you know I never intended to be a pastor, it wasn't my life dream, but now it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do, and it's the only thing I want to do. I, I want to preach, uh, I don't even want to retire, I, I just want to keep preaching, and then preach my own funeral, climb in the box, shut the lid... He's done, finally. Thank you. Moving on, right? But uh, one of the greatest joys is um, you have an opportunity to help people understand, you know, the problems in their life and how God, through his word, can help them. And so when people come to you and say, hey, something's with my marriage or something's with life or depression or, or you know, just whatever the struggles that life brings... And, and they'll come to, you know, a pastor or one of our pastors on staff. And, you know, if you can enlighten people to God's truth and see how it applies to everyday life, that's one of the greatest joys. Here's one of the greatest frustrations is when you show somebody or you say, you know what, this is, this is what God's word says. I've seen it work with me. I've seen it work with others. I think it could work for you. And they go, mm, thank you, but no. That happens a lot. I mean, that, that, that happens with Christians, church people. Is they say, listen, I want God, but I really want God on my terms. You know, I need God's help with my marriage. I don't want God's help with my money. Or I, I want God's help with my money, but not with my marriage. Like, we all have these little parts of our lives that we like to compartmentalize. And, and in those things, we want to do it our way instead of God's way. And, you know, I know I sound like a broken record, but he's a for real God, you know? And you don't get to pick and choose the parts of God that we like and the parts we don't. And so I was thinking about this, and it kind of reminded me of the big hit song from 1969 from old Blue Eyes, Frank Sinatra. You familiar with the tune? I'm not going to sing it for you. I will spare you because I love you, all right? But he made the song, I Did It My Way, famous. And, and one of the hard things is also being a pastor, having been to funerals where they play this song at the request of the deceased is kind of the theme song of their life, that I did it my way. What a horrible theme song. Here's some lyrics. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I traveled each and every highway. And more, much more than this, I did it my way. There's a lot of eyes in this song. 
Regrets, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. I did what I had to do. Yes, there were times, I'm sure you knew, when I bit off more than I could chew, but through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. It's like an anthem of self-reliance. And then the last stanza, for what is a man and what has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. Yes, it was my way. I just wonder how many of us We may not like Frank Sinatra, but that's our theme song. We're going to take just as much of God that we want, and then the rest will do it our way. If you have a Bible, if you turn with me in our study to 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14. Uh, We're still with the northern kingdom, in fact, because uh, I'm here for the gentleman. I brought another map. It's the same map as last week, if we could put that up there. Come on, fellas, you know you love a map. You got to love a map. Right? Failed chemistry, but you got an A in geography. Let's go. That was me. So we're dealing again with the northern kingdom. That is the breakaway kingdom. The southern kingdom is where King Rehoboam is, and this is the line of David and Solomon, the promise of God. And there's only one and a half tribes down there. The rest of the tribes have broken away, and they followed King Jeroboam. Now remember, Jeroboam was promised the world by God. God had said that if you will not do what Solomon did, but if you will remain faithful to me, I will establish you forever in this northern kingdom. But as we saw almost immediately, what did he do? He set up uh, high places. He set up places for idol worship. He created an entire false religion, established his own priesthood, and led all of Israel, the northern kingdom, astray. So that's where we are. 1 Kings 14, starting in verse 1. It says, At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise and disguise yourself, that it not be known that you are the wife of Jeroboam, and go to Shiloh. Behold, Ahijah the prophet is there, who said of me that I should be king over this people. Take with you 10 loaves, some cakes, and a jar of honey, and go to him. He will tell you what shall happen to the child. Jeroboam's wife did so. She arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. Now Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were dim because of his age. So let's just pause right there. There's a crisis in the kingdom. The crown prince is a child. We don't know his exact age, but he is sick. He is deathly sick. Sick enough to make this wicked king say, I need to get some real answers. And isn't it interesting? He doesn't go to his false gods. He doesn't go to his false prophets, his false priesthood. He goes to the God that gave him the kingdom in the first place. And the plan that he concocts is he brings in the queen, we don't know her name, it's just the wife of Jeroboam, and he says, disguise yourself, take some gifts, and go to the prophet that gave me this job in the first place. Seek God's help, ask him what will happen to the child. Verse five. And the Lord said to Ahijah, behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shall you say to her. When she came, she pretended to be another woman. But when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door, he said, come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another? For I am charged with unbearable news for you. Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, and yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only that which was right in my eyes. But you have done evil above all who were before you and have gone and made for yourself other gods and metal images, provoking me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, 
I will bring harm upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male, both bond and free in Israel, and will burn up the house of Jeroboam as a man burns up dung until it is all gone. This is aggressive. You awake yet? God's gonna burn him up like dung. Verse 11, anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And anyone who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat, for the Lord has spoken it. Arise therefore, go to your house. When your feet enter the city, the child shall die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. For he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave. Because in him there is found something pleasing to the Lord, the God of Israel, in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam today. And henceforth, the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and root up Israel out of this good land that he gave to their fathers and scatter them beyond the Euphrates because they have made their ashram provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and made Israel to sin. Then Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Terzah. And as she came to the threshold of the house, the child died. And all Israel buried him and mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Ahijah the prophet. This is a heavy passage to read, isn't it? Hope you have a great day. This is the reality of a for real God who demands our worship and demands things his way, and nothing has changed. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The God back then is the God today and will be forevermore. And this horrible prophecy is a result of the sin of the child's father, not just for him and his dynasty, but for this child and the entire Nation. Verse 19, it says, Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel. And the time that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years, and he slept with his fathers, and Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. This is God's word. And the title of this message is Nothing Hidden. Nothing Hidden. It's quite comical to me that Jeroboam, even though he's chasing after other gods and leading his family and all of Israel to do the same, thought that somehow if he put a disguise, if he put a mask on his wife and sent her with some gifts to a legitimate prophet of God, that somehow he could fool God. My friends, it's impossible. Galatians chapter six, I believe, says God cannot be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. Another way of saying that is God cannot be deceived. And so his son Abijah is ill, and so he sends his wife to Ahijah, and yes, that's a Hebrew wordplay, to this prophet. The prophet is old. It says his eyes are dim with age, and he's blind. And I don't know if you caught that. When he heard her footsteps, he already knew who she was. We don't know how she disguised herself. We assume she didn't bring the entourage and the security. She got some servant, you know, garb and maybe covered her face and she has the gifts. But God already knew, God already saw, God already alerted the prophet that she was coming. And he says, thus and thus shall you say to her. So the scripture says, when he heard her footsteps, he goes, wife of Jeroboam, why do you pretend to be someone else? I could ask the same question of the Tabernacle family, and I don't even know all the stories here. Why do we come on a Sunday? Why do we come on a weekend? And why do we pretend to be someone else? You've heard us talk about the masks that we wear, how we try to clean up to go to church, you know, how we pressure our kids to do the same. 
I know in this church, not explicitly, but I am guessing, if statistics are true, there's addiction of all sorts, there's secret sins of all sorts, there's probably some form of marital abuse, either emotional or physical or sexual. There, there's, I mean, the statistics of how many of us have been abused as children are astronomical. And it goes on and on and on. But when we come to church, we say, hi. Hi. And the higher the pitch, the thicker the mask, and the more it's not going well. And then we do crazy things like, you know, we drag our kids around, and then, you know, I'll meet you in the lobby or something. Not that I don't wear a mask too, but this isn't just for you, right? But then you bring your kids up, and you're like, you say hi to Pastor John. Say hi to Pastor John. What's the matter with you? The kid doesn't know me. He's five. He doesn't know if I'm safe. And that's part of the mask we, first of all, my name's John, okay, right? Second, I don't need to be friends with a five-year-old. Stop putting pressure on the five-year-old. Okay, now some of you have done that and right now you'll probably never come back to church. That's not my point. My point, that's part of the mask, isn't it? We want our kids to perform in front of someone that we want to be nice to instead of letting a kid be a kid. I'm just pointing out this, 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 this hiding, this pretending that we do. And sometimes it's about our failures and our sins, and sometimes it's about the failures and the sins of others that have been perpetrated towards us. This is my point. This is, this is the first thing I want us to get out of this passage right here. You cannot hide anything from God. You cannot hide anything from God. That thing, the thing that you don't want anyone to know, he knows. He saw. He sees. And he cares. Maybe it's something that you did or are doing. Maybe it's something you think is hidden or only a few select people know. Maybe it's something that's been done to you and you think it's hidden. Or only you and he knows. You cannot hide anything from God. We cannot pr pretend. The message of the gospel is that one day all of us will be unmasked. Our sin and our shame will be exposed. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it says, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give account. Did you catch that? Before God, we're all naked and exposed to his eyes, and he's the one to whom we must give an account. But there's also good news. The book of James says that if we confess our sins one to another, we will find healing. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins to God, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. So when I say to you, there's nothing, you cannot hide anything from God. If that strikes fear in your heart, I've got good news. Our God is a loving and forgiving God. And as we read the story, remember Jeroboam had opportunities to turn to God. In the very last chapter, a prophet was sent to him. If he would have repented in dust and ashes, all of that horrible prophecy wouldn't have been uttered before him, but it was. It was. What we're reading is his last chance, if you're just joining us. And it's not a chance. He's already lost the game. All of us will give an account. Nothing is hidden from God. And again, it's not just the things that we've done or are doing. It's the things that have been done to us. God wants to deal with all of it. And he's faithful and just that way. Do you believe that? Do you believe that for you or just for someone else? This sermon's gonna feel a little bit different. In Cadillac Manistee here in Buckley, we're gonna pause right now in the sermon. We're not done yet, don't leave. Some of you people that leave in the last prayer, you're gonna feel really foolish in a minute. Would you just bow your heads with me? 
We're just going to do a little surgery. We're going to ask God to do some surgery. Would you ask God, in the quietness of this moment, to shine the light of his truth on your life? Would you ask him to expose to you, because he already knows, those areas of your life that you've been masking, where you've been pretending, where you've been hiding from God and from others? And would you bring those hidden things to God just in the stillness of this moment? Just silently name them before the Lord. If there's forgiveness you need, ask for forgiveness. If there's healing that you need, ask for healing. If it's courage that you need to share it with someone else, ask for it. Would you bring your hidden things, sin or shame, to God? God, your son Jesus said in his time on earth that your house would be a house of prayer. And we pause right now, not in a formal prayer, but as a church in all these different locations with individuals asking for you to forgive our sin and to heal our shame and to give us courage to expose those dark places to your light. God, we cannot hide anything from you. Forgive us for the times that we think that we can, that we can put enough disguise or enough makeup on the places that we're ashamed of to somehow fool you. God, would you give us a healthy fear of your holiness and your name? May we not do things our way, but choose instead to do things your way for your glory for Christ's sake, and for our joy. Amen. End of part one. What's interesting to me, Ahijah exposes all of this to Jeroboam's wife, but that Jeroboam thought that somehow he would get God's help. I want to be careful how I say this. But isn't it interesting, as I mentioned, Jeroboam didn't send for help from the prophets of Baal, even though he had set them up to lead all Israel astray. He didn't send for help from the priests that he'd set up with the Asherim and the high places. When he faced a crisis, who did he go to? A God he believed in. Don't miss that. He sent his wife disguised with gifts to go to Ahijah the prophet, the one who had originally torn the cloak and said, I'm going to give you the northern kingdom and, and, and Rehoboam's going south and you're going to have this breakaway deal. She was sent to the real prophet of God. This leads me to believe Jeroboam believed in God. And this is the danger for us. Can just believing there's a God, can that save you? I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, you might say, well, Romans uh, 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, well, that's different than just believing in God. That's confessing, no, it's Jesus who is Lord, and I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Jeroboam believed in God. You know what it says in the book of James, James chapter 2? It says, you believe in God? Good. Even demons believe in God. That sarcastic clap, all right? Some places have done that and they join in. They're like, they're, no, that's sarcasm. You believe in God, good. Demons believe in God and that won't save them and it won't save you. One of my greatest fears is that we could be a church full of demon believers. 
a church full of demon believers. Jeroboam was a demon believer. And, and, and so this is the second principle that, that I learned from Jeroboam's action because you know he sent the gifts, they went to the prophet, and what did he find out? He found out that God is angry and God's righteous anger was exposed against him. Don't expect God's help while rejecting his rule. Do not expect God's help while rejecting his rule. Now, if you've decided to stop rejecting his rule, this great and loving and merciful good God will absolutely forgive and offer his forgiveness and help. But Jeroboam had no intention of changing his way. He was trying to work the system. He thought that somehow if he masked his wife, disguised her, she showed up with some gifts, he could get the thing and come on, it's for the child. And when crisis hits, that's what happens. You either lean into a faith that is genuine, and we all face the crises of life, right? You either lean into a genuine faith or you grasp for control. And for some people, that's actually crying out to a God that you're not even sure really exists. And who you really don't want to rule your life, you just want his help because you're in a jam. Whew, I'm fired up. Is this not true? Don't expect God's help while rejecting his rule. And God's serious about it. This isn't just a worked up preacher. So I preach from the ESV. I love that translation. But I, I did a little digging into verse 10 when, when, when he says, uh, um, he says this, thus saith the Lord, the house of Jeroboam is going to be cut off. I'm going to burn you up all like dung. He says in the ESV, which has been kind of uh, uh, you know, manicured and kind of made really Victorianized in order for you know, our church sensibilities in North America. In the original language, which is actually closer in the King James version, can't believe I'm quoting King James. Verse 10 says this, this is God's anger. He says, I will cut off every male, is what it says here. In the KJV, it says, everyone that pisseth against the wall. Some of you are ticked off because God said pith, well, that I quoted God as saying pisseth. You could take it up with him. That's how angry he is. He's going to burn them up like dung. All of the men, the, the, the male descendants are going to die. And he says, those that die in the streets will be eaten by the dogs. Those who die outside the city will be eaten by the birds. Do you feel the anger? Don't expect God's help while rejecting his rule, that's a frightening thing to think about. And God wants to rule every part of our lives. Every part of our lives. So here's part two. What area of my life, what area of your life have you rejected God's rule in? For some of us, we've never accepted his rule. At all. We're not Christians. That's frightening to think about. But it's also frightening to think about if, you know, I want his rule with my money, but I don't want his rule in my marriage. I want his principles for being a good person, but I don't want him to rule my sex life. I'd like him to rule my public life, but not my drinking. I'd like him to rule this part, but not how I spend my money. We all do that. Don't expect his help if you're gonna reject his rule. He's a for, real, a for real God, and he wants our yes in every area. For some of us, we, we, we're rejecting his rule with our own children. Or we want his help with our children, but we wanna to continue to treat our spouse the way we wanna treat our spouse. And so we're going to do some more heart work right now because that's a frightening place to go. Would you bow your heads with me again? We'll just keep doing this the whole message. And, and all I'm trying to do is create an interactive space for you to deal with God. Ask God, God, what area of my life are you not ruling in? And what do you want me to do about it? I think you know already. But ask him, God, what area of my life are you not ruling in? 
Is it my giving? Is it my serving? Is it my relationships? Is it unforgiveness? Have I been expecting your forgiveness and not giving it to others? Have you been demanding submission to others while not submitting yourself to God and his word? Are you hypercritical but don't want to be critiqued? Would you just take a moment? I invite you, if God has shown you a thing, to say yes to him in that area right now. Just talk to God. God, I want to give you my yes here. God, I thank you that we can trust you as the ruler of the universe. God, I thank you that not only is nothing hidden, but that you want your rule and reign to bring life and peace and truth and joy even into the toughest situations. God, would you give us the courage in Cadillac, in Manistee, here in Buckley, people watching online, to invite your rule into every area of our lives. God, we need your help by the power of your spirit. And in Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. One more part. Here's the good news. This isn't all doom and gloom. Did you notice one interesting thing In the midst of all that hard prophecy, God says, you know, the part about all the men are going to die and they won't be given a proper burial. That's one of the hardest things for a Jewish man. That's a horrible thing, to not have a proper burial, to not be mourned. Are you with me? And so this is part of the horrible judgment that Jeroboam has brought upon himself. And in verse 12, he says, Well, God says to Ahijah, to Jeroboam's wife, Arise, therefore, go to your house. When your feet enter the city, the child shall die. I mean, a horrible thing to even think about. In verse 13, it says, And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave. Because in him there is found something pleasing to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, did you guys catch that? The child who's stricken, the crown prince, will get a proper burial because somehow he's pleasing to God? I mean, I'm a parent. I don't want to lose any of my children, any of my grandchildren. And here, the prophecy of God is saying, this is a good thing. The the one who's going to die as a judgment upon you, in him there's something pleasing, so he will get a proper burial. How is that possible? That death is a good thing. The answer's in the gospel. There is a fate that is worse than death. And if all you believe is in this world and the few short years we have on this planet, you'll never understand it. But if you understand that there is an eternity and it's promised to those who love God, who have faith in God, then you know that this was actually a mercy to that child. Because all of the prophecy on his father's household and upon the dynasty, it's going to be horrible. There are going to be dogs eating bodies in the streets. There's going to be birds eating bodies in the wilderness. And they're all going to be cut off and burned up like dung. But not this child. He'll have a proper sending off. And an eternity with God. Why? Well, it got me thinking. What is it? It says that there's something pleasing in him. There's something pleasing in him. Well, if you know your Bible, you go to the book of Hebrews, and in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about faith. 
and it says faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. And it goes on to say, this is what the ancients were commended for. And then there's a list, like Hebrews 11 is like a list of the heroes of the Old Testament. That by faith Noah did this, by faith Enoch did this, by faith Abraham did this, by faith Sarah did this. And then it says in verse six, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if there's no wasted words in scripture, right here I just read that God said about the child that's gonna die, there's something pleasing in him. And then you go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, and it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. What did that little child, that son of Jeroboam have that no one else in the family had? Say it with me, he had? Okay, some of you are going to the happy place. All right, the rest of you. He had? He had faith. He had faith. He had faith, that's what saved him. This brings us to the last point. What pleases God is faith in Jesus Christ. We didn't gather here this weekend so, you know, John could talk about hidden things. We're never going back to that church because I want to stay, you know, hidden. And then we talked about, you know, repentance and all the areas of our life that we're supposed to submit to God's rule. Here's the good news. If you have faith, this pleases God. And the faith that you should have is not that things are going to turn out for the good. It's faith in Jesus Christ. You say, well, how did this boy have faith in Jesus Christ? I'm going to tell you, he didn't even know Jesus' name. But according to Hebrews verse 11, this is how the Old Testament heroes were saved. They had faith in Jesus Christ and they didn't even know him yet. They had faith in the promise of God and Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises of God. So this boy, and it's a beautiful picture, we don't know how old he was, with everything in his culture, his mom, his dad, his aunts, his uncles, his siblings, everyone else is chasing these idols. All of Israel's going after idols. Somehow, it gives me tears to think about. This child still had faith in the God who had his great-grandpa David's whole heart. I don't know how. I don't know how. And he still died. But he's with Jesus today, if the Bible's true. So there's good news for us. There's good news for us. What pleases God is faith in Jesus Christ. And so I have to ask, do you have faith in Jesus Christ? You have to have faith in Jesus Christ to trust God with the hidden parts of your life. Otherwise, forever you're going to be in a disguise and forever you're going to wear the mask and you'll never find freedom. You have to have faith in Jesus Christ to trust that he can heal your sin and your shame. He can forgive and died for the things that you've done, but also for the things that have been done to you. Jesus died for the ways that life didn't quite measure up. You can have faith in Jesus Christ and accept his rule. It's not a frightening thing. If you want to know what God's like, you look at Jesus. That's easy to accept his rule. He's the one who said, let the little children come unto me. And he did it here with the child Abijah. Abijah had faith and he was shown mercy. What pleases God is faith in his son. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine says that it's by grace that we are saved through faith. In fact, participate with me. It is by grace we are saved through, say it, faith. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one should boast. In Romans 10, when it says that we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that is faith. When we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that is faith. And that's the only faith that will save you. And so, what does your faith in Jesus Christ look like? You still doing it your way? The invitation this weekend is to stop doing things your way and instead choose to do things God's way. And when I say that, I mean in all the secret places. You can fool me. You can fool me. And thank God I'm not the judge because I can fool you. You only see the best 40 minutes of me that I can conjure up on a weekend. Trust me, I don't have it all together. But what would happen if 
all of us together would stop hiding from God and we stopped hiding from one another and instead chose by faith in Jesus Christ to say we're gonna be a community of believers that really believes in his grace and his goodness and his mercy, in his forgiveness. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome if all of us, at all of our campus, if we accepted his rule in every area of our life? So let's pray one more time. God, we need your help. And I thank you that you sent your help in the form of your son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for my sin and for the sins of the world. God, I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that today maybe for the first time they would place their faith in Jesus Christ and find forgiveness. God, for those of us that have asked Christ into our life, would you help us again to say yes to Jesus' rule and reign in every part of our life, in our parenting, in our marriage, with our money, with our stuff, with our job, with our fears, with our depression, with our sex life, with our home life? Would we receive your rule with glad hearts? This only comes with faith in Jesus Christ. So God, we need your help to be a church, men, women, young and old, that celebrate this rule. And it's in his name, the one true King Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're gonna do something a little bit different. Before we go, first I want to invite our prayer teams, Manistee, Cadillac, Buckley, if they'll come up. I want to say something about the prayer teams while they're coming. When someone goes to, 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 to pray with someone from our prayer team, can I just announce this? It's none your business. It's none your business. It might have nothing to do. I'm saying it right now. Look at me, look at me. It has nothing to do with what we just talked about. Maybe it has to do with, you know, the, the dog's got a bellyache. I don't know what you need prayer with, but these people want to pray with you. We want to be a church where we encourage people to stay and pray. Do you understand? No, you don't understand. Do you understand? Yes. Yeah. So that's what these folks are here for. If there's anything we've talked about today that you have a question about, they'll do their best to answer it. If, if there's something we talked about that you want help with, they'll answer that as well. Does that make sense? Secondly, there's cards in the seat back. We want to hear from you. Some of you would rather die than come up here and talk to somebody. You're just too af afraid. I get that. Would you write it on a piece of paper? I committed this. I did that. Please, if you made a decision to become a Christian, would you let us know? We want to help you. I'm not going to send guys with, with, with white you know, shirts and ties on bicycles to your house. <laughs> We're not trying to get your pin number or get, get you to join the cult. We're just trying to help. You with me, church? Are you with me? Just say yes if you're with me. Man, I love this church, but sometimes we have stiff necks. <laughs> the prayer team wants to pray with you. If you'll fill out a card, drop it in a red box. Let us know how we can help you. And right now, would you stand at what we're going to do? Stand in all three locations. We're going to read the benediction together. We're going to read this verse. It has everything to do with faith. When we're done with this, you're, you are dismissed. Thank you for being at this weird service today. And... Uh, um, I hope that if there's any way we can serve you, you'll let us help you. Let's read together. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Amen and God bless you.